so uh, I asked Shishin Roshi if he had any suggestions about what I might talk about, given that today was the Dharma transmission ceremony, and uh, he suggested that uh, that I talk about how I got here, and uh, and so I decided to take him at his word and start at the beginning. About 13 billion years ago, <laughs> a compressed blob of sorts of matter and energy suddenly began to expand. Um, it's, there, it's, there's a current controversy over when exactly this happened. I don't know if you, if you know about this, but uh, some people, uh, some scientists are saying 12.8 billion years, and some scientists are saying 14 and some billion years. Personally, I think the universe doesn't look a day over 12 billion. <laughs> um, anyway, we call this event the Big Bang, right? And I looked up these numbers. Uh, out of the Big Bang, eventually, I don't know how many billion years it, it took, Maybe Shishin Roshi does know, but, um, but eventually this expanding matter started to coalesce into planets and suns and solar systems and galaxies. And apparently there's, um, there's 30 billion planets in our galaxy alone, and there's something like 100 billion galaxies. So that's a lot of planets. And... Uh, in, the, in the wake of the Kepler space mission, they estimated, astronomers estimated there might be as many as 40 billion Earth-like planets mm. in the universe. Is that something? You know? So out of all that, this little planet that we call Earth starts to harden up and uh, happens to land in just the right orbit around the sun, and uh, somehow oxygen creates an atmosphere and hydrogen combines with oxygen and makes water on the planet and this ooze starts to percolate and something like three billion years ago somehow the ooze starts to replicate and turns into life and eventually another billion years passes some of that life crawls out on the land um, turns into frogs and and salamanders and such, and eventually into reptiles, and then an asteroid hits the Earth, and the reptiles are wiped out, and little mice, which were the warm-blooded creatures, eventually evolve into us. <laughs> and uh, so, a lot less than a billion years ago, 62 years ago, there was a little bang. <laughs> and, uh, we all came from both a big bang and a little bang and, and, uh, and in this little bang something like 40 million sperm were emitted and met one of between three and four hundred of the eggs that a woman produces in, in a lifetime and um, Nine months later, a child is born. And at first, the child is completely unified with the environment. And, um, and eventually, in the case of this particular child, um, it's uh, apparently, I started talking around 12 or 14 months, and around the time that language starts, we start to identify ourselves as separate beings. And a little acquisition of language, maybe it took a few months, but before long, all of a sudden, out of these countless causes and conditions, random events, the unlikeliness of it is enormous, that any of us should be here at all. Um, all of a sudden, I come to enough thought process to start thinking of myself as a separate individual, at which point I say, Hi, I'm here! I'm me! I did this! And that's where all the trouble starts, right? <laughs> so, I want to talk a little bit about that, the mind we were born with, the literally original mind that we were born with, and it can be really useful in Zazen 
to try and cast your mind back there because there was a time before we learned language, before we learned separation, when we were completely unified with our environment. We didn't realize that there was an over there and a me here. And we didn't realize that our mother was separate from us or our father or anything. But we didn't know we weren't separate either because we had no concepts like separate and not separate. So when Roshi said during the transmission ceremony today that, that um, the, the Zazen mind, or the mind of enlightenment, is, is beyond the conscious mind, or another way it's often described as prior to thought. So prior to thought, what was prior to thought when we were infants, really prior to thought, before we learned to think, what would the world have looked like? It's very interesting to consider. Now, of course, babies aren't enlightened yet. We have to go through a whole process to regain that freshness of view that we were born with before we knew what anything was. But it's possible through kind of active imagination to cast one's mind back there and kind of half remember what that might have been like. We wouldn't have known distance, for instance. I wouldn't have known that Mui was over there. Uh, all the senses would have been functioning. All of my awareness would have been functioning. But I wouldn't have seen depth, because depth is a function of mind. It's something that's learned. When, um, when people who have congenital cataracts have them removed, who people who have been blind all their life, they can't see depth at first. They see everything, they see uh, vision as a flat field with a bunch of shapes and colors all joined to the next. Mm. Isn't that interesting? That's the way we would have seen the world when we were first born. Um, there was a story about a man who, who uh, had one of these operations in the late 50s. There was a book written about this. Um, and uh, about thousands of people, there were these teams that traveled around the country and restored sight to people who'd never had it. And so they were able to study large numbers of people who, who had never had sight before and see how they see. And uh, he trained himself over months, depth, by every morning he'd wake up, he'd reach under his bed, he'd grab one of his boots and he'd toss it into the middle of the room. And then he'd step forward and see if he could reach it. And then he stepped forward again and see if he could reach it. And then he stepped forward again and see if he could reach it. And it took him months to train himself. What, what we know automatically is exactly how far to go to reach that thing. So we don't actually see depth. That's an imposition of the mind. Um, we don't actually see natively with our original minds. We wouldn't have seen separation. That's something that we learned, right? Um, And that separation, that sense of separation is where all the trouble starts. Um, part of why I went into the Big Bang and all that is, is to point up that it was mostly non-self elements that landed us in this apparent self, right? And obviously we have, on one level, on the relative le le level, we have a self. I, I love what the Dalai Lama calls it, the mere self, this, this thing that we just have to deal with. Um, and uh, Katagiri Roshi, I think, called it the provisional self. And, uh, but that's not the self we practice in Zazen. The self we practice in Zazen is the unified self, which is we're far more unified than we are separate. And, um, some of you have heard me say this before, but if you think that you're separate from the universe just because we're portable and we can move around in it, then go ahead and remove yourself from it. We can't do it right now. We've all wanted to, right? But <laughs> we've, all, we've all thought, oh my God, take me now. But um, we can't even remove a piece of paper from the universe. That's how unified it is. Uh, that's how unified our existence is. We can, all we can do is change its form. So, yeah, so I developed this self and it was problematic. I found it 
quite problematic. I, my parents divorced when I was uh, four year, between four and five years old. Um, and we moved to Florida because my health was already bad. A lot of you know I've had health issues for a lot of my life. And, um, and it was so difficult for my mother as a single mother to take care of my brother and myself that she put us in a foster home for two years. And I experienced abuse in that foster home. And um, when I, when my brother and I were finally rescued again and went back to live with my mother, by that time I'd formed into quite a frightened boy. And uh, very, very shy, very withdrawn. Uh, I was fundamentally scared of life. And, uh, and that continued pretty much through my childhood and adolescence. Uh, very fearful. I actually thought, uh, Shinko Roshi would laugh at this, I actually thought I was an introvert. <laughs> Shinko Roshi sometimes says I'm the only known extrovert in the Zen world. <laughs> um, Actually, but uh, I didn't realize that I was afraid, and that re was really what the issue was. And um, some of you have heard this story again, I'll just briefly touch on it, but I went to college and when I was 19 years old, still quite shy, frightened and withdrawn, fundamentally frightened, I'd say. Um, I, my fears somehow coalesced into these two um, neurotic fears that I would worry about a lot. And one was that I would uh, one day be paralyzed, and one was that I would one day go blind. Mm. And, uh, and these were obsessive fears mm. that would play in my head. And as I look back on it now, I really think that, that somehow the, all the fears of my childhood just like gathered onto those two mm. things. I'm so glad to be in a Zen setting where I can talk about mm -hmm. this stuff, because that was not, my early training was not to talk about emotions in Zen, right? At the Zen Center of Los Angeles. Um, and about that time, I was at a friend's house, and I was browsing through his bookshelf, and I just saw the spine of a book, and it just had the title, Awareness. I keep thinking I should go back and look at that book. And I remember, I pulled it off his shelf, and I don't know, he was in the bathroom or something, and I just had time to read the back, uh, the little blurb on the cover. And basically, the cover said, Practicing awareness is interesting, it's cool, you should do it. I thought, I thought, oh, it never occurred to me that I could practice awareness, you know? So, and I never read the book, I just put it back on the shelf. But something, but something stuck in my head, something stuck in my head about it. And so I actually started to practice this. And I had about a 15 minute, I lived in an off-campus dorm, I had about a 15 minute walk to my classes. And I just started to practice awareness on my walks to, to school. Just sit, I lived in Santa Barbara, I mean, really. It's easy to practice awareness when you're in a beautiful setting like this one or Santa Barbara. So I just let myself be fascinated by walking under the trees and the play of light and, and the leaves passing in and out of my peripheral vision. And I didn't realize that I was practicing a form of what we practice now, you know. Um, 